And now. Thank you for tuning in to Talkline Network Radio, America's longest running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community. Broadcasting live worldwide. The TalkLine Network proudly presents its flagship program, TalkLine with Zev Brenner, America's premier Jewish broadcast, the pulse beat of the Jewish community. And now, your host, Zev Brenner. Welcome back to the program, Mom. Zev Brenner with us once again. Our most one of our most frequent guests, Dr. Tevi Troy, presidential historian, author of numerous books. Uh, but tonight we're going to be looking not just at his conservative politics, but his conservative Judaism, and actually where what was previously conservative Jew. Now he's an Orthodox Jew. He and his brother, Dr. Gil Troy, are part of a podcast where they discuss why they left the conservative movement. He to become Orthodox, his brother to become a Zionist. Dr. Troy, Dr. Tevi, good to have you back again. Thanks, Zev, and I'm glad you clarified that I am now and uh, have long been in my adult life an Orthodox Jew. But uh, I did grow up in the conservative movement, and uh, both my brother Gil and I and my other brother Dan have all left the conservative movement, and we noticed that it's part of a recurring pattern that, in fact, I spoke to a woman who worked at the Rabbinical Assembly, which is the, the organization of the conservative movement, and she said, yes, uh, I work for the conservative movement. Our motto is, we raise non-conservative Jews, <laughs> meaning a lot of Jews grow up in this conservative movement, and if they are interested, they become Orthodox, and if they're not interested, they become Reform or or not Jewish, or meaning you know, there's been a... They intermarry or they go in a different direction. You know, for, so it's very hard for conservatives to sustain itself. Right, but for many years, I I know there was a... I, should I call it a war, a struggle, a battle between the Orthodox world and the conservative reform movement where they pretty much were at war with each other. But in a way, the conservative movement has been a feeder movement to the Orthodox community over the course of time, and you're a case in point. Yeah, I mean, look, if you go to a modern Orthodox shul, as I do, uh, but it's not just the one I go to in Kent Mill, but you go to a modern Orthodox shul anywhere, you will find many people who were formerly conservative Jews there. I don't meet that many people who were formerly Reformed Jews. You have them. There are some. But uh, it's much more common that someone will say, yeah, I grew up in a conservative shul, and now I, I go to an Orthodox synagogue, and that's just the way I do it. So what happened? What made you decide? You went to Salman Schechter High School. You grew up in Queens. You ended up going to Orthodox High School, Ramaz in Manhattan. What was the point that you said, I want to be Orthodox, I don't want to be conservative? Well, I, I just felt like there were actually young people in the Orthodox movement, and there weren't young people in the conservative movement. I think that was part of it. But I also felt that, especially when I was in graduate school at the University of Texas at Austin, and the, there's a wonderful rabbi, Chabad rabbi there, Rabbi Lovertov, and the Friday night activities there, meaning the davening and then the long, long fun dinners, uh, were activities that people went to, whereas the Hillel service in the conservative movement was something that you kind of, you couldn't wait to get away from. You went as an obligation, but it wasn't a fun thing to do or a place you wanted to be. So there, were, there was something to the orthodoxy that there's a vibrancy to the orthodoxy that, that I found in, in both the college and, and especially in the graduate school experience that made me do that. And then when I left and I moved to Washington, D.C., I started going to the Orthodox Synagogue Kesher Israel here. and I've been on that path ever since. So here's the interesting thing. There was a point in time when the conservative movement was the ascendancy in the United States. That was the in movement, fashionable. You had even Orthodox rabbis going to conservative congregations. So it was groovy. It was in. From what you're saying, though, know, things changed. Where When you were in college, um, you were more social in the Orthodox world and the concern. What happened to them that they went from being dominant to being stagnant? 
Yeah, and I want to make sure, make clear that this is just not my impressionistic feeling, but that conservative movement had about 40% of Jews 40 years ago. And so according to a public opinion surveys, this was the dominant movement. It was the, it had the plurality of Jews were in the conservative movement. And now it has plummeted and is now closer to 16%. Many of the conservative shuls, the large conservative shuls are, are empty and they just don't have the vibrancy and the membership that they used to have. Orthodoxy, and I don't want to get too triumphalist because orthodoxy is still a, a small minority of the overall Jewish population, but it is growing and it's where the you see the growth in the synagogues and the schools and in the young people. There was a study that showed, showed that uh, there was the famous Pew study less than 10 years ago. It said that something like 10% of American Jews are Orthodox, but 27% of Jews under 18 in the New York area are Orthodox. And so if you look at young Jews, they are much more likely to be Orthodox than just the if you look at the overall picture. So we're going to look from your perspective as somebody who experienced that change from conservative to Orthodox, but you're also a historian, so perhaps we can blend the two. So in your case, you found it to be more exciting, but can we pinpoint, and I know your brother also, I'll get to him in just a moment. So what happened? that it became more exciting to be in the Orthodox movement than in the conservative. What would you say was the change? And it's not just you, it's others as well. Well, it's two things and they're related. Number one is a lot of young Jews, once they left their parents' homes, they were if they were conservative, they either weren't going to synagogue or they were going to Orthodox synagogues. And so the Orthodox synagogue was much more likely to have young people both people who had stayed in the movement from birth and they'd gone to Orthodox camps and Orthodox schools, and so they, they knew the drill, or people who were joining it from other places. Whereas in the conservative movement, young people in their 20s just were hard to find. And I think part of this is that it's really hard to define what the conservative movement stands for. The reform movement says that halakha, Jewish law, doesn't really matter in today's world, and we're just we're a cultural people, the Jews, and that there are some benefits to being Jews, and they, they have a heavy overtone of politics. The Orthodox movement says, we believe in the halakha, we believe in the Jewish law, and you still have to adhere to it. It doesn't matter if it's two, 3,000 years later. This is the rule. These are God's rules, and we stick to them. The conservative movement says, well, we believe in the halakha, we believe in God's rules, except when they don't correspond to what we think today in the 20th and now 21st century. So we're willing to make changes to accommodate modern realities. Well, modern realities in 21st century America may not be the same as modern realities in 22nd century Argentina or, or to just Judaism according to the modern realities, I think leaves a religion that is subject to more and more change and less and less understanding of why the change happens. And so I think the in a, in a weird way, the fact that orthodoxy sticks to the original program, meaning it, it doesn't change the halakha, the Jewish law, according to what's going on around us, makes it fresher and more vibrant than a movement that's constantly trying to change with the times. If you constantly try and change with the times, you will always be behind the times. Now, it's fascinating sociologically how things have changed. Now, in your case, it was college. Your brother is Dr. Tevi Troy, who also is, writes books and uh, he had a change as well, left the conservative movement, but he didn't become Orthodox, he became Zionist. What happened to you that you became Orthodox, and I assume you're Zionist, I know you are, and that he became Zionist? Well, I mean, so let's put it this way. I know you I'm are, I'm yeah. Zionist in that I'm pro-Israel, but I did not choose to move to Israel. He has chosen to move to Israel and really embraces the Zionist title, and he wrote a book, Why I'm a Zionist. And he also, you know, it's, it's not fair to say that he's not Orthodox. He doesn't identify as Orthodox, but he keeps a kosher home, he's Shomer Shabbat, his kids study in yeshiva, and they're all, uh, I would consider all of his kids fully orthodox. So uh, I think he's just, he's orthodox adjacent, is, is what I joked on the, on the so podcast. So why does he call himself orthodox then? If he's, do, if he's eating the kosher and keeping Shabbos, his kids are orthodox. So what, is it the, the background that, what holds him back from saying I'm orthodox? I, I don't think he's maybe found the the Orthodox community that works for him, or maybe he, uh, you know, he, he has. So when when you grow up in a conservative Jew, you hear that Orthodox, you know, that's the group we don't want to be part of. So you know, there's a lot of uh, issues involved, and the, the, what prompted this whole series was an article that he wrote on the 
anniversary, the first anniversary of my mother's passing. And my mother was a proud conservative Jew. My father was not only a proud conservative Jew, but was an educator in the conservative Jewish world. And I think he was talking about how his parents were successful in passing on the Jewish tradition. And now they have 11 Jewish grandchildren, but they weren't able to pass on conservative Judaism. And that's what really prompted the whole conversation. How did your parents take when you changed and in a way you rejected the background, the lifestyle that you grew up with to become Orthodox? What was their reaction? There, there was some resistance to, to a degree, especially when my oldest brother, Dan, became Orthodox. But, but at the same time, the overriding principle in my parents' home was that you had to stay Jewish. You had to marry Jewish. You had to be part of the community. And look, my brother Gil said, as rebellions go, going to the right of your parents, meaning being more religious than they, is a brilliant one because they can't really criticize it too much. Uh, even though you heard stories about parents whose kids uh, became Chabad or became Hasidish when they wanted to deprogram them, and to a certain degree they preferred maybe they'd be on drugs than to be Hasidic, which Hasidic lifestyle, they just couldn't relate to it. You hear stories like those are probably, you know, more of an, an exception, but they abound. You hear about it. Yeah, I think you hear also stories about the parents would rather the kids be uh, intermarry than become Orthodox because intermarriage is less of an interference with the lifestyle, meaning you can all go to the same restaurants and it doesn't get in the way if you want to go out on the weekends. Uh, but Orthodoxy is an interference with, with the lifestyle. Uh, but that, that was not my parents' way. My parents wanted their kids to remain Jewish. They wanted to have Jewish grandchildren. As I said, they successfully had 11 Jewish grandchildren. You listen in the Orthodox community, in the community I'm in now, and I say, oh, my parents had 11 Jewish grandchildren. They said, ah, big deal. You know, well, I have 15, I have 30, I have 60. I mean, they, they're, they're so much bigger families. But in the milieu in which my parents were living, there's nobody. They, they have no peers who had that number of, or maybe, you know, very, very few peers who had that number of Jewish grandchildren because there was so much intermarriage among their peers and so many people who moved away from the path of Judaism. So I would say that, again, they were successful in passing on Judaism, but not successful in passing on conservative Judaism. What was the reaction of the conservative movement when this podcast came out? Well, my brother Gil, who is, I guess, closer to the conservative movement than, than I am, has gotten some criticism, and he got a. Um, there, there was a response to his article that was written that that said, "Oh well, it's not necessarily the experience that this particular rabbi says." So, you know, there, there's definitely been some some criticism from the conservative movement, but the facts are the facts. I mean, that that reduction in the movement from forty percent to sixteen percent. Uh, it is a big reduction, and this is something that the conservative movement recognizes and struggles with. No, I, I can you imagine. Can't really, them. say that it's not true that conservatism is losing people. They lost market share, and that's certainly when you're a movement or a business, you don't want to lose market share. You want to gain market share. Would you say that to a certain degree, and this probably holds more for the conservative movement than the reform movement, that the biggest challenge they have today, aside from the fact is that you know, they can't define what their ideology is and it keeps shifting, but Chabad, in a sense, has replaced the conservative synagogue in lots of communities. Yeah, actually, Jack Wertheimer, who is a professor at, at, at JTS, the Jewish Theological Seminary, has really written a wonderful book that informs a lot of my thinking on this stuff. It's called The New American Judaism. And he talks about how these, the, the both conservative and reform to some degree, uh, they, they have heavy costs, meaning the, um, the, the, the fees to join the synagogues, the dues are, are expensive. And Chabad comes into town and kind of undercuts their, their model by saying, well, you know, come to us for a bar mitzvah and we'll just give you the bar mitzvah and you don't have to pay dues from age, from age birth to uh, age 13. And, um, and that really is, is changing in some ways the face uh, of Judaism. And he wasn't critical of it per se, although the conservative movement could be critical of it. Uh, but, he, but he was saying the fact that there are these kira, these outreach Jews, and that are not just in the Chabad Lubavitch movement, by the way, but there are other types of Orthodox kira of outreach Jews. And they are giving another way of having the connection to Judaism and getting the, some of the Jewish services without necessarily being full-time part member of, of one of these larger synagogues. Fascinating. Very, very interesting because in a way they've supplanted. And, and by the way, when it comes to bar mitzvah, not only is it free, I believe the amount of training for bar mitzvah is less in Chabad than it might be in some conservative synagogues. Yeah, I mean, 
it depends, it depends on what the obligations are. I mean, you'd have to, I was expected to read Torah, read a half Torah, give a, a speech and uh, at, at my bar mitzvah, and that was in a conservative shul. I, I, you know, I, I've been to a Chabad, I go to a Chabad shul sometimes here in Silver Spring, and sometimes the bar mitzvah boy will read the whole Torah reading. And sometimes he'll just do one aliyah. So uh, I, I think there's just more variety. Chabad will work with you at the level you are at. And I've heard from others, some son, they have sup supplanted to a certain degree the conservative movement. That only adds to why the numbers have decreased for the conservative movement. Yeah, but Wertheimer also says that they face a challenge from the left in that if a son of someone from a conservative synagogue goes to the rabbi and says, I want to marry this non-Jewish woman, then the rabbi will say, we don't do that here. So then they'll go to the reform synagogue down the street and the rabbi will say, sure, we're happy to do this intermarriage for you. And then when the, that son goes to the reform synagogue to get his wedding, then the parents move to the reform synagogue and the grandparents move to the reform synagogue. So they lose three generations in, in a single shot. And that's why there's pressure within the conservative movement on this question of, of intermarriage. In the Orthodox movement, there's no pressure. It's just, we, we don't accept intermarriage. But conservative movement, because it's made changes and shifts to its doctrine over the years, then there can be pressure to say, well, you, you change this doctrine, why don't you change that doctrine? And but, I think that's another challenge they face. But they're considered to be reform light to a certain degree. So there's very little difference in between a conservative synagogue and a reform temple these days. So that's also accelerates because the reform has an ideology, you know, they're not yeah. bound by halakha, they're not, uh, you know, they've adapted certain Jewish rituals that were a yarmulke, though some of them will even have kosher food, which they didn't have years ago. So somebody where the conservative movement is, sh is shifting and f deciding to define itself, the reform was defined, the orthodox movement is defined. So if you want to go to the left, you got it, you want to go to the right, but somehow where they were or are is very hard to maintain. Yeah, I think the, the, the key modifier you had in there, Zev, was these days, right? So it, in some ways, it's hard to tell a conservative from a reform service these days today. But 35 years ago, when I was going to a conservative synagogue, it was it was easy to tell the difference. I mean, the, the conservative service was, was pretty similar to the orthodox service that I have today in my synagogue, except we, we, there were two big exceptions. Number one is there was no mechitza, meaning separation between men and women, physical separation. And number two is the conservative synagogue used a microphone and the Orthodox synagogue didn't. But now if you go to a conservative synagogue, you, it, you can, you'll see a lot more similarities with a reform synagogue, including the, the use of uh, instrumentation, musical instruments, um, and you'll, you'll see the, um, a lot more politics involved, largely liberal politics, and women are involved in more aspects of the service, meaning the women will read the Torah or lead the davening, often the woman is a rabbi. That was not the case in the conservative movement that I grew up in. It was just closer to orthodoxy. But they became egalitarian, which changed the face of the movement too. Absolutely. And I believe there are significantly more, not only rabbis graduating who are female these days in the conservative movement, but also uh, rabbis in the training programs who are female than, than male. It'll be another discussion from what I understand the reform movement because they have so many women involved, less men are becoming are coming to, as well. And 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 it was interesting to see how COVID is going to affect because if you can go to Zoom congregation, it makes it less important to go to a real congregation where you can just hop out of bed, turn on your Zoom, and you're in services. I think that's going to have a yeah. tremendous impact as well. Yeah, I'm not sure I use the word real congregation. Maybe I'd say physical or in-person congregation. When I say real, I mean, say, I mean physical. That, that's what I meant, you know, physical con yeah. congregation, right. right. But let's say you take someone who grew up in New York, like me, and now lives in Washington. And if I were going to Zoom, maybe I would just go to the conservative Zoom synagogue in New York that I grew up in, as opposed to going to a, a local synagogue. You, you, have, you have kind of more geographic flexibility now in the Zoom era, whereas in orthodoxy, You've got to go to your local synagogue because you have to, if you want to say Kaddish, you have to have a minion in person. And if you want to hear the Torah reading, you've got to hear a minion in person. Absolutely. Dr. Tevi Troy, as usual, thank you for being with us. Uh, he's a well known historian, presidential historian, 
and uh, he has written, well, this in case is the spoken word, a podcast with his, him and his brother, Dr. Giltroy, dealing with why he and his brother left the conservative movement to become, in his case, Orthodox, his brother's case. I'm going to call him Orthodox, too, but he identifies himself as a Zionist. So thank you for sharing your thoughts with us. Thanks so much, Dave. Always good to talk to you. And we're going to be right back. Don't go away. Stay tuned. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thanks for listening. Talkline Network Radio, America's longest-running Jewish broadcast network, the voice of the Jewish community.